Okay, I'm going to take you out to the East Coast now. I was hoping to actually talk about um, some work that we're doing in Alberta, but we're not quite there yet to get it up onto a, a presentation. I'll talk little bits about it. But I wanted to give an example of what we're doing with the hyperspectral to uh, see if I can uh, get some discussions going with you afterwards about what we might be able to do uh, in the oil sands region and in agricultural regions and so forth here in Alberta. So uh, to give you an idea of the issue in Nova Scotia, um, gold mining started there in the early 1900s, back in the day where you went with your hands, dug out a bunch of ore, uh, a bunch of rocks off the surface, bathed yourself in the rocks and mercury, grabbed the, rock, the gold that came out, um, and in Nova Scotia there is lots of natural arsenic so what you've done is released a lot of arsenic and mercury into the environment. Uh, these areas um, are usually nearby wetlands. If there wasn't a wetland there it was actually created back then uh, with the idea that you're slurring lots of water, lots of liquids through uh, so you can get your gold out. So this area here uh, is just a picture of the site. This is a hundred years old and nothing has grown on it because it's so contaminated, mercury, arsenic and so forth. Um, this is one of the wetlands that the water is pouring through. So these things exist around the Maritimes. They're becoming health hazard issues um, and they're becoming areas that we're just learning needs to be cleaned up basically. So. Uh, slightly different than the states you have where you have active mining in Alberta and so forth. But a lot of the techniques that we want to apply are going to be similar to what we're doing here. So hyperspectral remote sensing. Um, the idea behind hyperspectral remote sensing is looking at 200 or so different color bands basically in an image. Uh, so you have an image of your site in this case, this is from the EO1 Hyperion uh, sensor. We have an image of our site. We have 190 or so spectral bands uh, within our image. And this is the uh, abandoned site here, the tailing site. Uh, the Atlantic Ocean, lots of lobster fishing going on down there. And we wanted to see, this was just a test case, uh, we could join up with the geologists who go out there and actually take their samples and see if they have tailings in them to see if we could work with them, utilize their data, utilize some spaceborne data and basically help them out. Um, the idea, I threw this slide in here since I don't know how many of you even know what hyperspectral is or work with it. I know there's quite a variety. Uh, the basic idea is you have uh, an image, you have a whole bunch of planes. The main purpose of hyperspectral versus traditional Landsat, for example, is that instead of having discrete uh, image bands where you want to know the magnitude of the radiance or the reflectance, you can actually get the shape of the reflectance. So you can start asking things about the shape of absorption features. So instead of saying my infrared is bright and my red is dark and therefore I can get an NDVI and tell you relative this is producing well and that isn't vegetation wise, I can now go in there and say well the shape of the liquid water absorption feature in my vegetation is telling me this. The shape of my chlorophyll feature from the vegetation is telling me that. The shape of this mineral feature is giving me more info. So with hyperspectral we want to use the shape. It's a little more challenging to get there um, but I'll be getting into that. So we have our Seal Harbor site uh, where we did our demonstration study. We have EO1 Hyperion which was launched uh, quite a while ago um, as a technology demonstrator and what that label means as far as I'm concerned it means it has really bad signal to noise uh, compared to what you could put up there. So it was meant to go out there and show you could do hyperspectral. It wasn't meant to show you could do it well, it was just meant to show you can do it. Um, but, and this is a sample image uh, that we get from it. So we have, this is Seal Harbor Lake, uh, Three Corner Lake, the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, this is the um, 
Westbrook wetlands that flows into the ocean. And this is actually new, if you heard of offshore oil production in Nova Scotia, uh, this is where it comes onshore through a pipeline here, some sort of facility uh, for shipping it. For all I know, they'll ship it to Alberta to process this. You want to ship your stuff to, be, or to New Brunswick and so forth. Um, uh, with the Hyperion data, we're talking about 30 meter pixels. Uh, so we're looking at um, we're looking at things that are obviously less than 30 meters, like these wetlands uh, in size. So we're not looking to specifically identify them. We're looking to detect things within them. Um, and as I was out in the field with the geologists, um, I always like to bring this up that when we bring together remote sensing and other fields, we often use the same words to mean different things. Um, this is one specific lesson I learned out of this study. Was they were talking about the reflectance of surface features. At surface reflectance, measured on the ground. And it turned out that when I talked about them, when they talked about them, we were actually talking two different things. They were similar things, but they were different. Uh, they measured their reflectance by taking their probe, sticking it right on, shining a very bright light on it, which was hot enough to evaporate water out of the sample, and measuring the reflectance. And they just hoped that their measurement was fast enough not to get rid of too much water. So um, they never did leaves, for example, because they would just burn a hole through it. Okay. Um, but they were doing this with some biotic things in the environment. We looked at a parent, what we ended up calling a parent, BRF, uh, where the sun in the sky is our light source. We're measuring the light reflected off in a certain direction. Um, but the aim of both methods of what we did was to get the magnitude and shape of specific spectral features that we were looking for. Here are some example targets of what we wanted to find. What the geologists would go out and do is get this fine sand tailings, get uh, this, chemically it's the same tailings, but it has more water built into it, into its chemical structure. Uh, and then of course we had certain grasses. Um, by coincidence we found out marijuana grew around this area a lot too, but that's another story. Um, but anyway, so uh, we, we got lots of neat vegetation, we got lots of neat sand in the environment. Um, I should point out, uh, one thing that was never taken in consideration, they knew the tailing site was here, they knew it existed in certain areas around various wetlands. Uh, in Nova Scotia it's such that you get a lot of snow, it's warm enough that you promote snow, if that makes sense. If you get too cold you don't get that much snow. Nova Scotia you get lots of snow, you buy the Atlantic you get a lot more snow. Um, you get a lot of melt in the spring, all of your wetlands fill up everything erodes out of this site and down in through all the wetlands. Uh, and that was the part uh, that they didn't know the impact of this. Um, so we went out, got our tailings, got our, our direct spectral measurements. Of uh, We have quartz here as an example. There's lots of quartz, of course. Um, but they have their yellow tailings, brown and gray tailings. They did their chemical x-ray diffraction analysis and all that to have more scientific terms, but uh, yellow, brown, and gray was easier to say. Um, one thing to note, uh, I've put the uh, atmospheric absorption uh, areas on the plot here. Uh, water vapor, there was talked about SAR being a water map. Hyperspectral in many ways is a water vapor map, and that water vapor prevents us in a few wavelength bands from actually seeing the Earth. Uh, so if you were looking in just these specific bands from space, you wouldn't see the Earth. The atmosphere would be opaque because of water vapor. Um, a lot of the mineral features that they were interested in hide in these features. So you need to calibrate, you need to measure things very accurately in order to, you're looking through a noisy part of the atmosphere, in this case with a sensor with a poor signal to noise, you need to really calibrate well to minimize those influences. Um, 
We have the apparent BRDF method uh, where we also looked at the vegetation. So we had our different end members. We knew what features we were looking for. Uh, the aluminum hydroxide, iron hydroxide, and magnesium hydroxide spectral features um, that existed in the tailings out there were determined to be the key indicators of what we were after. And we did a little comparison uh, between the two. Our magnitudes were different between the two techniques, um, but our absorption features were in the same location. So that was another paper that we did, but it's just the idea that if you're talking about specific things, you want to make sure that they're well-defined when you start sharing between the different scientific disciplines. Um, so we went out with our imagery. We said, well, we have these tailings in the environment. We know they're right here. We want to know where else they are. Uh, one of the first things we did was we, of course, looked at our image, went out to select sites so that we could see where clear cuts, grasslands, wetlands, and so forth were in the environment. Um, we went through and from the image extracted sample spectra of these. Um, we did that with something called ISTAS, the Imaging Spectrometry Data Analysis System. Um, I throw that in here. That was initiated by Carl Stans before he uh, left Ottawa and came here to join you. Um, we're still developing this and it's a technique of just looking directly at the imagery going through all the impacts that exist whether from the sensor design or from the atmosphere to remove, evaluate, correct for all of those influences as much as possible to get an at surface reflectance as a high quality as we can get. Um, a side effect of that of course is that if we know the physics behind all of these things, we can go back and simulate what we think another space or airborne sensor can get. Um, and that's something that we want to do with a lot of the Alberta data coming up in the near future. Um, but we did all that calibration. We got our sample spectra uh, from our different sites. And just to throw some spectral curves up there, Again, it's the shapes of what we're looking for that's important. Can I see? I guess the top ones are, oh, the red one here is the tailings. Um, I mentioned that we're not looking for specific 30 meter by 30 meter pixels that have 100% concentration of what we're looking for, but we're looking for target detection within a pixel. So we're looking at something called unmixing the image where we assume we know the spectra of almost everything that could be in the pixel. We admit that we don't know everything, so we have a nice error term here that basically says there could be something else. Um, and that the sum of everything that has to be in that pixel has to equal 200%, or has to equal 1. So you can do a lot of mathematical wrangling um, and extract out of I know spectra can I get out how much of each spectral type is there? Um, so we do that, we got this kind of what we call an unmixed map. Uh, every pixel color here, I could probably have chosen my colors a bit better, um, shows if the pixel has the most of that object in it. Um, so the lakes, of course, 100% water, they come out blue. Uh, we've got our uh, Wetlands and our clear cuts did not delineate well in this case. We were there in August, so we didn't really expect them to. Um, this is a case where it was mentioned uh, uh, having a static water map is not as useful as having a dynamic water map, base map. This is one thing uh, that we really look forward to working with SAR and getting. Uh, but one thing that stood out, uh, the thing we're looking for, of course, are the tailings. We saw our initial site that we extracted our spectra from. We saw it in the wetlands kind of downstream. Uh, this is the major wetland flow for the tailings. And they weren't expecting to find tailings as far down as we did. And when we got there and started sampling the lobsters, we actually found the contamination in the lobsters. So we had the, the unfortunate side effect of impacting the lobster fishing in this area. 
Um, but we also discovered tailings in what should be upstream wetlands. Um, and I think somebody noted that beavers change the directions of water flow sometimes. That was a case here where what is now an upstream wetlands used to be or becomes a downstream wetlands when the beavers and the water heights go up and the beavers change things. And uh, so we actually found tailings contamination in a three-quarter corner lake up here, which was not expected. So we found the tailings in our known sites where they actually did the mining 100 years ago. Uh, we found the expected tailings um, and we found sites where they were previously unknown, where nobody knew to go look for them. Uh, before it was always feet on the ground, go out, grab some dirt, analyze it for tailings. You go where you suspect it. In this case, we found it where it was unexpected and because we were able to look at it in a regionally uniform manner. So we have this kind of application, this kind of technology that we'd like to bring to the oil sands. Uh, to do that, we have, um, this is the Fort McMurray area here, Lake uh, Athabasca um, in Edmonton down here. We have a suite of airborne acquisitions, hyperspectral and LIDAR, over the Fort McMurray, Fort McKay area, some down by the Cold Lake area. Uh, we're just receiving those now from the data provider, so we're calibrating them, getting them cleaned up. We have a bunch of spaceborne imagery from the Hyperion sensor, um, and we've done a bunch of uh, field work as well. And we want to get to questions utilizing the shape of the spectral features to ask about water stress, chlorophyll stress. Uh, so looking at the shape of those features. We want to look at the wetlands polygons, the bog versus fen, to see what indicators spectrally delineate the two as well, um, if any. Um, we, of course, look at the extent of tailings ponds, of the uh, mining activity itself. That's going to be mostly with respect to remediation. Uh, as they say, things are clearing up, cleaning up, however it's defined. Uh, we want to monitor that. We had a big project uh, in Sudbury um, where we monitored that as well, the greening up of areas they were liming. We were able to help them target areas that weren't remediating according to their standards. Uh, and they were able to go in and promote further remediation. So we're hoping to provide that kind of uh, input as well. Um, and as part of that, me being a physicist, I'm interested in making sure the data quality is up to snuff so that, again, we're using the sun and sky as our incident light source. We're not providing our own. That means a little more effort has to go into understanding the calibration of your data to make sure you have well calibrated at surface reflectance. Um, and we're also interested in simulating uh, airborne and spaceborne sensors. Uh, Canada has two in the initial phase proposal now. Uh, Germany, Italy, and so forth, other countries have some in various states uh, of development. Uh, and the question always is, if I have this application from my airborne sensor or even from my ground truthing capability, how does that work when I scale it up to my spaceborne sensor? What am I giving you to help direct you to know to go there in the first place? Um, so that's part of the big component that we're going to look at at CCRS. Um, so that's a lot of what we're going to do uh, in the oil sands area as well.